So just let me say those things again so that there's a context. So like I said, multiculturalism was born uh, on the North American continent, uh, mainly in Canada first, and then uh, it spread to the United States of America. Uh, and uh, after that, it went to Europe. Uh, it went to Europe and it went to France. Uh, for some strange uh, reason, it hasn't found too much traction in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, it's the United Kingdom is it's almost like they have rejected it. Now, uh, get lost kind of a thing is uh, what the people in the United, the scholars in the United Kingdom did with it. Okay, and uh, uh, but it did gain a little bit of traction, very, very little bit. So you have this lady called uh, Catherine Oda, uh, and Oda, she doesn't agree with one of the names that I had mentioned to you. Michael Walzer, she doesn't agree with him. We'll go into the disagreements uh, after we understand what multiculturalism is in the first place. Uh, and uh, so off late, it has found uh, a great deal of uh, patronage in India. Uh, and uh, before uh, you people joined, since uh, Akshay was the first person to join the meeting, I had a small bit of a conversation with Akshay, uh, where I told him that uh, I think that multiculturalism uh, is some kind of uh, rubbish, especially for us Indians. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, what happens is what ha the fashionable trends in the Western academia they tend to come to us and uh, we kind of adopt them uh, without really paying too much attention to whether uh, it is really necessary for us to adopt these different uh, theories and theoretical frameworks that are generated in the West. Uh, you must always remember that uh, like all philosophy, political philosophy is also a reaction a very, very 
natural reaction to the social uh, conditions that prevail in a particular geography. So that is the reason why these days uh, people emphasize on political geographies as well. Uh, if you look at, for instance, if you look at uh, Catherine Odar, uh, Catherine Odar is somebody who basically believes that republicanism of the French Revolution variety is the way forward for European society in general and for French society in particular. So she's also not a very big fan of uh, multiculturalism. It is, uh, and if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, UK, the United Kingdom, in the United Kingdom, they stubbornly adhere to uh, the individualism that uh, came in with liberalism. It might have undergone some changes uh, in the 19th century, thanks to Karl Marx and uh, individualism did give way to, uh, instead of talking about a minimal state, uh, it did give way to the idea of a welfare state. Uh, welfare state in which uh, people, uh, a welfare state in which uh, people will be taken care of by the state uh, and uh, that the state was not an instrument of class exploitation as it was supposed to be according to uh, Karl Marx. So it made that slight adjustments and uh, when libertarianism made its appearance in America and when it became with uh, Benjamin Tucker, uh, when it became something, uh, I told you libertarianism in its origins was left wing uh, left-wing anarchism, actually. That is what it was. But it was up to Benjamin Tucker uh, uh, who basically uh, converted it into a, a very inelegant phrase, which is right-wing. It is not really right-wing, but he converted it into liberal uh, a offshoot of uh, liberal philosophy, liberalism. So he made it a subtype of uh, liberalism, Benjamin Tucker. We've been through this. I hope you remember these names. And uh, again, it was uh, Murray Rothbard uh, who gave uh, libertarianism, uh, another push in the direction of classical liberalism. And so you find uh, people like uh, Frederick Hayek, who's primarily uh, uh, an economist, uh, he is somebody who gets classified by the Americans as a libertarian economist. 
but the British call him a classical liberal economist. So classical liberalism kind of made a comeback. I told you the, I can't, I'm not going to go and repeat all those things that I talked about, but we will talk about classical liberalism once we start talking about John Locke in your Western political philosophy classes. Um, and uh, classical liberalism made a comeback because of the fact that uh, in the 1960s, uh, there was a crisis and uh, the crisis was that, no, I'm not going to go into that now. That'll keep me occupied for another 15 minutes. We'll talk about that later in, in the context of John Rawls. Okay, so uh, classical liberalism found revenues going down and and uh, therefore, uh, you will find that uh, uh, it is something uh, that it, it comes back. And you have the uh, Thatcherite form of uh, capitalism and classical liberalism, where she said it's not really the duty Margaret Thatcher, when I say Thatcherite uh, liberalism, uh, she said it's not the duty of the state to take care of people. The, she said it's not the duty of the uh, state to take care of the people. And uh, she wanted everybody to be an entrepreneur. And I told you that entrepreneurship went in various directions. It went into drug addiction, drug peddlers, and it went into the world of music, uh, where you had these ra uh, rave and trance uh, music parties that were held in abandoned uh, industrial go downs and uh, sheds, huge, huge places. Uh, inside there would be a party going on and outside there would be the drug peddlers sitting in their cars and the boot of the car or as a dicky, as we call it here, uh, would be where all the drugs were. And uh, so the trade ran from cars. And so individual entrepreneurship of uh, this form took over England. And that is when you find that, you know, Classical liberalism makes a comeback uh, in England, and you'll also find that libertarianism uh, in its definitive form uh, makes its uh, appearance in the United States of America uh, under the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan's economics were not very dissimilar to Thatcher's uh, economics uh, and Reagan also wanted uh, people to take care of themselves. Uh, while he would, uh, I talked to you about the Star Wars uh, plan, which was actually uh, called the strategic, uh, strategic uh, missile defense uh, system. Uh, but it was popularly called the Star Wars uh, strategy of uh, Ronald Reagan. And uh, so you have these instances when uh, 
liberalism comes back in america it is called uh, libertarianism because by now it had and you had robert nozick who wanted this minimal state and he wanted it to be uh, called the night watchman state he called it the night watchman state and you i'm not going to go back into those arguments right so this is one of the things that happened in the 80s and uh, this led to unfettered individualism uh it was like every individual has to take care of himself or herself uh, there wasn't even the involvement of a category like family there uh, the thing was maya close the door no uh so so yeah so it it went into an extreme individualist phase but to connect what i just told you to multiculturalism which is what we are going to be discussing uh now in this multiculturalism what you actually find is that there is a tectonic shift i'm borrowing uh an ad uh, uh, uh sorry a uh, particular phenomenon from geography to explain uh what actually transpired in uh, america uh the a tectonic plate movement usually either causes a volcanic eruption or it causes an earthquake or both so when you talk about tectonic plate movements you are talking about disruption so there was a large scale disruption following uh ronald reagan and his policies and at that time uh rolls john rolls was not a bad person uh and quite a few of the academics in uh, america turned to john rolls because they found in john rolls an ideal compromise between uh you can figure out for yourself what kind of social solidarity i told you it was regarding the redistribution of primary social goods and uh, 
So since uh, Rawls was actually talking about something uh, which was, which had a component of social responsibility. <clears throat> Sorry, a component of uh, social responsibility and ultimately that culminating in individualism, which I told you was to be found in this particular principle of uh, equality of beginning and inequality of consequence, which I explain to you with the metaphor of a race. You have to ensure that everybody starts the race at the same time. But once the race starts, it is up to those who can run the race faster than the others to win the race. So that has been the stand of liberalism. Uh, of the Lockean variety. But uh, due to changes in capitalism from the Lockean times uh, to say even the Rousseauian times, you will find that this equality of beginning was not available. And uh, so you have people like Rawls, finally talking about justice, which was otherwise not a subject which was ever talked about by liberal philosophers. Uh, you find Rawls placing justice in the middle of, in the center of uh, liberal political discourse and uh, at the same time he's not sacrificing the basic principles of liberalism such as individualism. Ultimately it is the individual who has to eke out uh, living for himself if you have been handicapped uh, by birth, if you have been at a disadvantage because of where you were born, then it was up to society to share their primary social goods, which I told you were uh, political rights, and then it all expanded to include education, nutrition, uh, you know, proper living conditions, all those things. So they all uh, expanded into this. But despite this, uh, people continue to remain individualists because it was up to the individualist to make or break his life. So at that time Rawls was acceptable to most people uh, because he talked about justice as fairness. I hope you remember this. He talked about justice as fairness and some people even took this one step forward and said democracy also is fairness. 
Okay, they said the goal of democracy should be fairness. Uh, that's not what uh, Rawls said. This is what other people said. But Rawls found an admirer and a critic in uh, Michael Sandel, who gave a very famous lecture in Harvard, which is where Rawls taught all his life. Uh, in the Harvard University uh, and Michael Sandel gave a lecture there and Michael Sandel's lecture uh, is now available in the form of a book called Justice because that was the subject uh, and uh, what Sandel did was to appreciate roles, but criticize him He kind of criticized him for being an individualist and uh, he, Sandal, wanted uh, justice to be communitarian. Now, all this is preparation for multiculturalism. Okay, Michael Sandel, uh, a lot of people have uh, actually criticized me for uh, my constantly repeating this, I say that Michael Sandel is a dwarf riding on the shoulders of a giant. The giant is John Rawls. Michael Sandel is a dwarf and he found favor with the Christian communities and uh, the reason why I say he's a dwarf riding on the shoulders of a giant is because Michael Sandel is not somebody who is talking about one large community of people.
Michael Sandel is talking about different communities. Okay. And uh, these can be traced back to the notion of church going communities that Antonio Gramsci called civil society what happened here can you hear me yes sir yes sir because i was getting some notifications that uh, my audio has changed to something else. Yeah, Antonio Gramsci called it civil society. He called this church going communities civil society. So though Antonio Gramsci has his roots in Marxism, I for one would disagree with the idea that he's a Marxist. He's not a Marxist. He was inspired by many things, one of which was Marxism. Uh, it would be very, very uh, unfair to Antonio Gramsci to include him in the category of Marxists. Uh, he is somebody who draws inspiration from Machiavelli. He draws inspiration from uh, the Roman Catholic Church. He draws inspiration from Karl Marx. He draws inspiration from anarchists like uh, Proudhon and also from other thinkers uh, of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, finally, he was initially uh, a supporter of uh, fascism before it became a bad word, before Benito Mussolini converted it into a very, very bad word. Uh, so you see the, there are so many different uh, influences on Antonio Gramsci. And uh, Marx called a civil society uh, he said it is nothing but uh, the bourgeois. Uh, that is what Locke wanted anyway. It, he called it the bourgeois civil society, uh, which is also uh, uh, which is also a phrase which Rousseau used. Uh, to describe what he called civil society. He called it bourgeois civil society. Uh, and uh, Antonio Gramsci says that civil society need not be bourgeois. It need not be of the rich. And there he talks about church going communities. He talks about how church going communities can form into civil society and how that in itself, uh, 
how that in itself can lead to radical changes in society. So Sandel, Michael Sandel, that is, uh, some of the Americans pronounce him as Sandel. Sandel. Uh, I don't think that is the correct pronunciation. The correct pronunciation is Sandel. Michael Sandel borrows this communitarianism from this idea of church-going communities. Uh, that is why he is a, a favorite with a lot of Republican caucuses or members of the Republican caucuses in America because they are like we have the cow belt here in India. There is a Bible belt in America, which is all the states in the Midwestern part of America, states like uh, Montana, states like uh, Colorado, uh, Denver, Wisconsin, uh, all these different kinds of states, uh, they form the Bible Belt. And uh, this is where being a member of a church going community is very, very important. But of course, uh, you'll have to read between the lines uh, when you read that book, Justice by Sandal, to get the picture that he's talking about Christian church going communities because he doesn't state it obviously he doesn't state it in a very obvious manner okay uh, so his lack of originality and his unfair criticism of John Rawls uh, is basically what makes me say that if there was no John Rawls, there would have been no Michael Sandel. Okay. Rawls created a magnum opus with his a theory of justice. And uh, Michael Sandel made a career out of his academic life by praising but criticizing John Rawls and by talking about how Rawls stopped halfway uh, with his idea of justice his idea of justice would have been complete if he had taken it to its logical end. And what is the logical end? The logical end is justice for a community, which is not something very clearly defined by Sandal. What kind of community are you talking about? Anyway. <clears throat> So, but Sandal is important because uh, he's one of the key figures who talked about communitarianism and uh, communitarianism
now the thing that you need to understand both about communitarianism and multiculturalism is that they stress on the individual's identity as being a part of a larger identity which is the community or the cultural group that a person belongs to <clears throat> so this is this is how communitarianism began that shift towards multiculturalism when we talk about multiculturalism today Incidentally, the book that I have edited that's going to come out has this theme. It's called Politics of Identity, Gender and Development. Uh, when it comes, I'll give you all one free copy. Okay. Uh, so this is the beginning of Politics of Identity in a way and when we look at it should be i'm sorry claims that identities and difference does not mean that there are goals at variance with each other 
you can have common goals with different identities. A lot of what multiculturalism is, uh, is word play. It plays on words and it tries to make you believe that the impossible is possible. But before that, you must understand why did both communitarianism and later multiculturalism, why did they come up on the North American continent? Why did they come up on the North American continent? For years, Americans claimed that America was a melting pot of cultures and that there was one identity which was American. This is, what is happening here? This is patently false because America practiced segregation. The obvious segregation is that of the blacks the native Indians or American Indians, not us people who went there. But apart from these very obvious segregations, they also followed segregation of the Irish, the Germans, and the Anglo-Saxons. This is what they did. They kept saying that it's a melting pot of cultures. But you go to America, every city, every city has a German town. Every city has an Irish town. It has a, a Chinatown. And uh, most of America doesn't have Indians in big numbers, but where uh, there are Indians in large numbers, one place being New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, it has a very large 
Indian population. Texas has a large Indian population. But the largest Indian population that you find is in California and that too in the Silicon Valley or the Bay Area as it is called. Uh, and here you find Indian ghettos. Like if you go to Plainsboro in, uh, in New Jersey, you get a feeling that you're in India. You go to places like Dallas, you get You get go to a place like Dallas, you have Indian settlements, our Indians, not the Indians. And in uh, California, you have this whole city called Fremont that is full of Indians and Indians only. Sunnyvale is another place where there are all Indians. So much so that in the hospitals there, the doctors are also Indians. Doctors in Fremont, Fremont as they say, and uh, Sunnyvale, they are mainly Indians. Uh, you have Indian restaurants everywhere. You get Desi Dahi. So, where is the melting pot? There is no melting pot. So that is the context in which you have to see the context of there not being a melting pot and Reaganomics and Reagan's politics, which left the individual to his own or to her own devices and almost made orphans out of them. That led to the emergence of these different movements, first in the form of communitarian, communitarianism, and uh, later in the form of multiculturalism. Now you must understand that multiculturalism is to be seen as being different from Pluralism. But now they, I can't type that, there's no space. Initially, multiculturalism was seen as a passive concept. Uh, but over a period of time, it is not a passive concept. Pluralism is when groups come together and make demands. That's what you call pluralism. Okay, which is, I told you, that example of that Belgian village which had a population of five to 7,000 people, had only one church. 
then Muslims from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro, a lot of them went and settled in Belgium in that particular town and they formed a separate uh, identity of their own. They formed a separate townships of, they formed a township of their own, built about 30 plus mosques and demanded that in that particular area, they will have, they will not have Belgian laws in that particular area where these people were living. They will not have Belgian laws, but they will follow the Islamic Sharia. Now that is pluralism. Pluralism is where you emphasize the difference and become an activist and claim rights saying that my culture is different from yours. Multiculturalism initially wasn't that. It only said America is not a melting pot. It talked about there being separate identities and the necessity to recognize these different identities. It talked about that, but slowly it has started moving towards pluralism. It talks about minority rights now. Now minority rights are very, very different from how we understand minority rights. For us, a minority rights is a religious minority and uh, they claim their rights. That's how we understand it. But the multicultural understanding of minority rights is that there are minority cultures, small cultural groups with distinct ideas, uh, sorry, identities of their own. And uh, that these people will follow, they should be given rights which are not based in Christianity. Because please remember the world over today, I've so many times told you the idea of Sunday being a day of Sabbath for the Christians and therefore a holiday. Where do you find a weekly off in uh, what is today called Hinduism? which I reluctantly use, I prefer Sanatana Dharma. There is no such concept. There's no Sabbath. It's there only in the Abrahamic religions. Uh, these three Abrahamic religions, Judaism uh, and uh, Christianity and Islam. So, you basically see that it was a question of an imposition of an imposition of a certain religious groups, cultures, culture, sorry, religious groups, culture, becoming the culture of all. So it became, it, it, the whole idea of multiculturalism came up as a 
moral, ethical question about the right of the majority to impose its identity and everything that comes out of that identity culturally and culture I told you is a composite of politics society and economics so in this composite you will say that you are imposing this particular composite on a group that is not big in numbers. Now, I know I have to shut up Madam Padma, I'm making my last point for today. Uh, I only want to tell you one thing. The way this works in America should be seen as being completely, completely different from the way it works in India. In India, we've had a melting pot of cultures. In India, we've had a melting pot of cultures. It has only been the leaders who fractured it and made it appear that there is greater dissimilarity than similarity. The tendency in India the natural tendency in Indian society has been to emphasize commonality rather than difference. That has been the natural tendency. So introduction of multiculturalism, especially when it is taking on the dimensions of pluralism are those which can prove, they can prove to be very, very dangerous for the unity and integrity of this country. Uh, Padma, you can leave if you have other commitments. Uh, I want to say one or two words to Vishnu Priya. Are you here or has she left? Sir, I am there. You're there. All right. Uh, Vishnu Priya, initially all this will seem like gibberish to you. Yes, sir. Hmm. Now, what you need to do is, let me give you an example from my own life. Okay, sir. When I was very, very small, I used to go alone and see uh, Hollywood films in a theater near my house, which is called Liberty. It used to show various Hollywood films. I used to go there, sit in the theater, watch the film, try to make sense of the dialogue. Maybe for the first few months, it just didn't make any sense. Just didn't make any sense. And that is when my resolve to understand, to understand the language became very, very strong. 
So there was even a time when, you know, uh, it was just the interval and I thought the film was over because I didn't understand what was happening in the film. Uh, I came home and uh, my cousin was there and she said, uh, how come you're already back? I said, the movie is over. She said, how can it be over so soon? It must be the interval. Go back and see the movie. So I ran back. It wasn't very far. So I ran back to the theater and lo and behold, the movie was on. So when things seem to be like gibberish, that is not the time to quit. That is a time to strengthen your resolve and to pay attention because these are all recurring themes. All these are recurring themes over a period of time. It's a good thing you've joined early because it gives you time. And time is always of the essence. It gives you time to make sense of all these things, which are now completely, completely alien to you. It is completely alien to you. Yeah, you want to say something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Don't run away. If you run away, then you'll never understand these. And if your goal is to crack the UPSC, you have to know all these. Just remember that. Okay, sir. So don't be alarmed by the fact that you're not understanding what is being said here. And you have the full freedom. If I say Anglo-Saxons and you don't know who are the Anglo-Saxons, you have a right to say, ask me a question. Who are the Anglo-Saxons? And why are they called Anglo-Saxons? You have a right to ask me that. So, uh, give me a few days. I am actually doing work for which I should be paid at least a couple of lakhs. I'm doing it free of cost apparently, to a bunch of people who don't seem to deserve it. That's taking up a lot of my time. There's a new university, a new school of public policy coming up. Now, the people who are setting that up have no idea whatsoever as to how to do it. Now, somebody told them my name and they found that I was the one who set up the School of Public Policy and Governance in, uh, in uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And uh, they also came to know that I was instrumental in the setting up of a center for uh, funded by the UGC, a center for uh, public policy, governance and development.
Uh, I'll answer that. I'll answer that. If they are Germans, then why will I call them Anglo-Saxons? But good, but good, 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 good. I'm impressed. That's a good question. Yeah, so because I have set up all these things, they are sitting on my head and making me, there are some seven of them who are pulling and pushing in various directions. I'm sitting and wasting my time with these people. I've decided that uh, I'll just give it a few more days. And if things don't see the light of day properly, then I don't want to be associated with it. So I shall say, you go your way, I'll go mine. So that's how it is. Anglo-Saxons are Germans, yes. But they're not Germans. Because at that time there was no Germany. There were different tribes in what was called the Prussian Empire. You must have heard of this. The Prussian Empire was a mighty empire. One of the biggest in Europe after Roman Empire. It was a pretty big empire. It covered what is today Austria, Germany, Hungary, then um, Czech Republic, Slovakia Republic, Poland. All these areas were under the Prussian Empire. And there were a number of tribes in it. The most well-known tribes are the Goth, Gothic. Tribes, they are called uh, Ostrogoths. Visi gods then you had the Sabines and you had the Slavs And Anglo, the pronunciation is not Angle, it is Anglo. So that is a tribe from Germany present-day Germany. The area today is called what is it called? Saxon There, I'm missing something. Alsa is Lorraine. No, no, no. Alsa is in Lorraine. Or, uh, I'll tell you a joke about that later. 
this is Saxon Rangan or something like that. Um, it is pronounced Sashen sometimes. I don't know. The Germans, uh, they have a chip on their shoulder because German was called a guttural language. They cite try to soften sounds and in doing so they converted the ch which was originally pronounced as a kh like you would do in urdu kh so it was saxon something uh what is it i can't remember let me try and remember later but that in English was called Saxony. Okay, that particular region which is Saxon something. In English it was called Saxony. So the Angla tribes, men and women from Saxony went and conquered what we know today as England. Which was before that conquered by the Gauls. Do you know who the Gauls are, Vishnu Priya? Don't know, sir. Well, Gaul is the old name for France. Gauls are French people. And uh, they have left behind a language along with that of the Vikings. Do you know who the Vikings are? Actually, not the Vikings, the Flemish. Okay, it's getting complicated now. I think this is getting to be information overload. The Flemish people who, were, who spoke Dutch but came from the Flanders region of Belgium, they were called the Flemish. The Vikings were the Swedes. Uh, and the Norwegians. They are also called Nordics. Okay, at one time, people from Norway were called Normans. Uh, now they are not called that, they're just called Nordic people, uh, along with the Swedes. Otherwise, they were Vikings and Normans. Uh, and the language that came into being along with these people is that which is Gaelic. It's spoken in Scotland and uh, parts of Ireland. I'm sorry, it's spoken in Ireland and parts of Scotland. And it has influences of French in it because the Gauls were there in England. You'll have to look at a map to understand what are all these areas that I'm talking about. And uh, England actually was originally called England. It was called England and then the A got replaced by the E and it became England instead of calling it England, they called it England. And finally, the E became E and became England. So I keep telling this again and again. My apologies to the rest of you who are still there. How many are there? Oh, there are. There is one more person apart from Akshay and Rachna. Who's that one more person? 
anyway uh so in telugu we say english is anglam angla is the correct pronunciation so when we say that it is angla angla bhasha we are being absolutely right in calling it what it is so the influence of uh, german and french on the english language is pretty high but it would be incorrect to consider english french german all these languages to be purely european thanks for what uh, akshay has pushed off oh yeah so akshay said bye by saying thank you anyway so the thing that you need to understand is if you have a i have interest in this so i have done a lot of work if you look at the family tree of languages in europe and in india they are now called indo european languages you will be surprised to know that there is this in the list of indo european languages you have hindi urdu marathi gujarati punjabi and bengali these are the indo european languages that are in india apart from that farsi or that which is called persian and then now the other one being arabic not the whole of arabic a bit of arabic the whole of farsi is indo european a bit of arabic is indo european english is a very very indo european language from among from among all the european languages which come from india so we could actually call ourselves native speakers of english because there's a lot of indian languages in english and french is the other language which is indo european as is german so these three languages from europe are very very strongly they have strong influences from india and the other one of course is latin latin is also an indo european language just let me give you a few examples in sanskrit what do you call a brother bhrata in latin i'm sorry i mean in english brother sanskrit mata mother so you see that is what i mean by the family tree of languages i'm just giving you some very obvious examples there are many other words like that and latin 
is not as people think as old as Sanskrit. No. It is not as old as Sanskrit. It is a much, much newer language. But the interesting part is the four South Indian, from among the four South Indian languages, Malayalam is the only language which figures in the Indo-European list of languages. Kannada, I mean Tamil and Telugu, later on they said even Kannada, they are classical languages and that they are older, older than Sanskrit. But those languages which are the, the Telugu, which is older than Sanskrit is called Acha Telugu. The script that it used was called the Brahmi script. And uh, I believe now there is no one who knows Acha Telugu, which is the original Telugu, which is called Tenugu. It became Telugu later. Andhra has nothing to do with the region where we are. Even what is called coastal Andhra is not Andhra. Andhra is a valley that exists between Pune and Mumbai. If you are traveling by train, you'll see there will be a board when you're going from Pune to Bom, uh, Mumbai. On your right side, you'll find a board somewhere around Khandala and Lonavla. Andhra Valley Power Corporation. The Shatavahanas were the original Andhras who came from there and they adopted, I mean, they brought the Tenugu language, not adopted, sorry. And they conquered this part of the south and then went up north the Shatavahanas. Okay, so anybody who tells you that I'm Telangana, son of the soil, all that is bankam. Nobody is a son of a soil. Somebody has come from somewhere else. Everybody has come from somewhere else. There are no sons of soil anywhere in India. What America is today, a country of immigrant populations, that is what India once was. So there are no sons of the soils. That is the biggest load of nonsense I have heard in my life. It's complete unadulterated nonsense. Okay, so the language was Telugu, it became Telugu, Telugu. But today's Telugu is 90% Sanskrit. So it is no longer a classical language. It is a modern language. Rajshekar Reddy prevailed on the government of India, which is the UPA headed by the Congress to grant the status of uh, classical language to Telugu, but there is nobody who knows that classical language. Same thing with Kannada. They granted the status, but nobody knows the classical Kannada. The only surviving classical language in the south 
and that too not the everyday spoken language which is tamil the there are texts and scholars of classical uh, tamil as it is supposed to be pronounced uh, they are still there so you see these are all indo european languages so we could very well call ourselves native speakers of english it is very much a indo european language um there are so many words in it that you can identify but that's not how you identify you identify it with the syntax the way the language is constructed the syntax of english is very similar to the syntax of indian languages so if you actually draw a language tree english is not really an alien language to us all the more reason for me to say that you should learn english rachna madam if you are still there sir learn english properly okay sir it's the simplest language you can think of okay okay, okay sir. yeah padma i think has gone off she just put that thing there and she's ah uh, no sir i'm listening how come i thought you had some other commitment and that's no, why no but i thought not to leave in the middle no no you can i told you you should go once i got into miss vishnu priya here i said you can go hmm. so that was for her benefit because she's come in in the middle and what she's going to see is one whole load of gibberish so that's the way it is so vishnu priya do not lose heart just give oh, me a, yes, give me a few days let me sort out my problems with this this public policy fellows and uh, once that is sorted out this way or that it will most probably be this way which means nothing will come out of it uh then i'll uh, schedule a separate session with you on zoom and explain to you in person what these various things are and how you have to approach political science if you want to understand it so i'll go rubric by rubric i'll tell you what is political theory i'll tell you what is international relations i'll tell you what is comparative government and politics i will tell you what is public administration and public policy and i will tell you uh, uh oh thank you you don't have to thank me uh so i'll i'll tell you all those i'll tell you all those rubrics uh it consists of six or seven rubrics they have grown in the recent past and uh, there have been inversions of roles at one time international relations was considered to be a part of uh political science but today people say international relations is a large area of which politics is one part okay 
So we'll go through those so that you get a picture, a clear picture of what is what. In fact, let me schedule this for Saturday. Saturday evening, five o'clock. Is that okay? Okay, sir. If there is anyone else attended, interested in attending, Madam Padma, you can tell people, I'll just draw the whole, what is political science thing? I think you people also need to know that. Yes, sir. If anybody is interested, it's not compulsory. Right. If anybody is interested, please come. Yes, sir. Okay. Rachna Garu? Okay, sir. Okay. So everything is fine in Nizamabad? Yes, sir. It's the time we, we, we all people are going to field work, sir. It's, it's the time. Okay. Sorry. Good, mm. good, good. I want to go to Nizamabad and see. If not anything, that Vijaya Theatre. I remember it. it. It was like this. It had a semicircular front. Uh, with some kind of uh, architecture in it. And it was painted in some kind of red color at that time. Yeah, I'd just like to go and see that. And I'd like to go and see the Hindu school, the Nirmala Hridaya convent. Mm. I'd like to go and see that. My mom taught in Nirmala Hridaya. And she also taught in uh, the women's college. Uh, I'd like to go there and see. My first memories in life are from Nizamabad. So, yeah. So, thank you very much, Madam Padma. <laughs> no, sir, don't thank uh, me. Ap apologies for not being clear enough and telling you, you can leave. Um, I I didn't mean it sarcastically. I knew you had another commitment. But I also wanted to take care of Vishnu Priya. Otherwise, she'll feel like an orphan. Yes, sir. I understand. Uh, yeah. She... And that's why I wanted to kind of stay because only one, two people will be left. Yeah. Hey, shut up, idiots. For her not to feel alone and for you not to feel alone teaching. Thank you. Yes. Really appreciate it. Very, very, very much appreciate it. And thank you, Rachna. Thank you for staying on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir. Yeah. Vishnu Priya, so Saturday be ready, huh? Five o'clock. Okay. okay, sir. Right. No, not thank five. Five thirty. 5.30. Okay, sir. Yeah. That I can do in an hour. I'll stick to my commitment. All right. But don't miss the classes in between, huh? Okay, sir. You just keep seeing what's happening. Write down these names. Writing, write, sir. Yeah. Write down these names. They'll make sense one day. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Right. Oh, thank you very Bye. much. Bye.